Hello, people. Hello, teacher. <laughs> I'm back on my regular computer, so I shouldn't have problems like I did last Thursday. Unless the thing dies, which could totally happen. Here's the other computer. I don't know. Let's let's rock and roll. See if we can get through this before my computer dies. Okay. Oh, uh, so today, you lucky people, you're going to see the second half of chapter eight. Hopefully, we'll get through it. Um, and this is about active transport. Um, so the first half is all passive transport, always going downhill in energy, always going down concentration gradient. This is the opposite. It's going to always be going using energy and transporting something against its concentration gradient or producing a concentration gradient. So we've got two different ways this can happen. <laughs> Second one, second one, second. Okay, two different ways this can happen. One is direct active transport, which is here. Direct active transport is when the protein in the mem membrane, the enzyme, um, uses energy from ATP to push something out against its concentration gradient. Here we're making a hydrogen ion gradient by using ATP. Indirect active then is when you use this concentration gradient to move something else. So indirect active is always a co-transporter. Um, sometimes symport, sometimes antiport. But here you've got, remember, when you've got higher outside than inside, that is stored energy, right? Because that's really low in entropy. <clears throat> and entropy says it should be the same on either side. So you can use that energy to pull something else into the cell. And typically you're doing this when, well, mostly we see this with uh, glucose, when you wanna suck all the glucose into the cell, po that's possible. So we'll see two examples when that happens. So just starting out, um, we'll talk about ATPases. ATPases are called pumps. Um, other transporters are not called pumps, sometimes people are, are um, tempted to call other things pumps, but only ATPases are called pumps. And an ATPase then is going to use ATP to move something across the membrane. Um, uh, uh, and usually it's just one ion. We've got the example of NKA, sodium potassium ATPase, that moves two things. Um, uh, sodium out and potassium in, but most things are going to be like our calcium ATPase that are only grabbing one thing and moving it. Um, and we've got four different types of pump. One is, oops, one is the P-type pump, and P stands for phosphorylation. So it phosphorylates itself as part of its mechanism. Um, Sodium potassium ATPase is one of those, and we'll talk about the mechanism of pumping of these um, proteins a little bit later. So that's your P-type pump. So sodium ATPase, calcium ATPase, whether it's in the plasma membrane or in the uh, uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum is a P-type pump. Our Second type of pump is the V-type pump, and V stands for vesicle. So this is only found on vesicles. And typically, the main example we have here is the V-type pump that's on endosomes that become lysosomes. So we'll talk about the whole endosome lysosome thing in the next chapter. But basically, endosomes are pre-lysosomes. They're little vesicles that are packed full of um, and digestive enzymes, and they have these V-type pumps in the membrane. And then when they fuse with things to destroy, um, the V-type pump, pump will turn on and it will pump a uh, hydrogen ion into the lumen of the vesicle, and that acidifies the vesicle. Part of the, um, the process of the uh, 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 lysosome destroying things is it becoming acidic inside. So that's our second type of pump, the V-type pump found on vesicles. And really this is our the only example I have for you is the hydrogen ATPase. Now we've got a different hydrogen ATPase that we see in the F-type pump. The F-type pump is prokaryotic basically. 
So it's seen on all prokaryotes, but also because mitochondria and chloroplasts are, you know, endosymbiotic, they, they, their origin is, is prokaryotic. They have these types of pumps as well. So this is called the F-type pump because it's got an F1 and an F0 subunit. Um, I believe this is F1 and this is F0 or something. I don't remember exactly, but um, it's kind of named for the opposite of what it actually does. So it's called an ATPase. ATPase means it hydrolyzes ATP um, and breaks it down into ADP. Actually, it's reversible though for a lot of these pumps, especially this one. So basically what this pump is doing is converting a hydrogen ion gradient into ATP. Um, this is in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So the, the inner membrane of the mitochondria has got, um, has got the um, uh, electron transport chain in it. And the electron transport chain is always transporting hydrogen ions out of the inner space and into that space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. So that gets really acidic. So then you've got this concentration gradient of hydrogen ions between the inner uh, the inner part of the mitochondria and the and the space there. And this F1, F0 ATPase lets the hydrogen ions come back into that inner space. And in the process, it makes ATP. So that's where most of our ATP comes from. This is what's keeping us alive right now. Okay, so that's your F-type pump. Mostly the thing to remember about this, this is mitochondria. For us, mitochondria and chloroplasts for plants. Um, and who cares about fungi, right? Unless they're making beer for us, what the hell good are they? Or, or mushrooms, mushrooms are tasty, but they just have mitochondria, no chloroplasts. Okay, so that's our F-type pump. ABC type pump, this is the fourth and final type of pump. So ABC stands for ATP binding cassette, which is kind of a weird name. Basically one of the subunits here binds ATP and it's a cassette because I guess genetically, this chunk of the gene can be moved around between different genes, or at least it seems like that happened during evolution. So they call this ATP binding uh, domain a cassette that, get, that can be moved around. Kind of a weird name. I'm not really sure why they called it that. What you really need to know about these ABC type pumps is, again, they're mainly prokaryotic, but also eukaryotic. And they don't have a specific um, a specific substrate necessarily. Um, all the other ones are, you know, uh, pumping one ion usually, hydrogen ion, sodium ion, something like that. This is going to grab organic chemicals and move them. So it's not specific for one particular chemical, but just kind of like unknown crap in the cell that that the mitochondria wants to get or the the cell wants to get rid of. So any kind of organic chemical that floats into the cell here. This will grab it and then pump it out or grab it and pump it in, depending on, on you know, which way it's arranged, what, what the cell's up to. So why is this important? This is important of us to us because the main example we have here is the MDR, multi-drug resistance protein. So this is bad because it, in prokaryotes, is going to grab any kind of antibiotic and pump it out of the cell. So this provides antibiotic resistance to prokaryotes. Um, again, think about it in terms of any kind of organic chemical that is unknown inside that bacterium, it's gonna grab and pump out. So if normally, you know, a bacterial cell would be um, sensitive to a uh, antibiotic at say one micromolar, now it's pumping it out of the cell. So you have to go to like, 10 millimolar molar before you kill the cell, that's basically resistant. You're never gonna kill that cell with that antibiotic. You need a different one. So that's, that's part of it. And also same thing with um, eukaryotic cells and uh, cancer agents, uh, anti-cancer agents. So sometimes a cancer cell will start producing this MDR and it's really hard to treat a cancer like that with um, with chemotherapy because they become resistant to it because they pump these things out of the cell. Okay, so ABC type pumps. 
They're basically pumping organic chemicals and the substrate is not as specific as it is with the other ones. Those are four types of pump, P-type, V-type, um, F-type, and ABC-type. So um, I really like going over mechanisms because mechanisms, I think it helps you to understand how energy goes into the system and how it's used actually. You know, it, it kind of seems like magic till you really look closely at what's going on in the cell. So let's go, let's take a look at the, um, a close look at the sodium potassium ATPase. Sodium potassium ATPase. This is a really important enzyme. It's in all your cells. I, I've heard estimates that like 30% of the energy your body uses is being used by the sodium potassium ATPase. So that's pretty goddamn important. It's only one enzyme. Um, and what it's doing is pumping three sodiums out of the cell for two potassium into the cell. And it's in all your plasma membranes and it's constantly active. So that's why um, uh, your cells are going to be really low in sodium inside and really high in potassium inside. Um, so constantly pumping sodium, the extracellular fluid, you know, that bathes your cells, the concentration of that is de of, of ions in that extracellular fluid is based on the concentration in the capillary where it um, equilibrates with. And so in the capillary is blood and what's controlling the blood um, ions is your kidneys. So your kidneys are controlling the sodium and potassium balance in your blood and that's what's outside your cell here. So what's controlling the sodium potassium inside the cell is this bad boy. So outside the cell, typically you've got about 120 millimolar sodium and about five millimolar potassium. Inside the cell because of this, you've got 145 millimolar potassium and about 12 millimolar sodium. Let me put that in here because I think that's, that's kind of an interesting little factoid. I'm a big fan of factoids. Okay, so this is what, 120 millimolar Na plus five millimolar K plus. And once again, Zoom is allowing you to see behind the curtains of how these beautiful slides are made. It's a very complicated process. Okay, so those that's our concentration gradients of sodium and potassium, and it's because of this enzyme. So let's see how it works. What, how it works is basically um, it flips between two conformations. So we saw that with transporters before. The difference here is energy is being put into the system. So it's got a low energy conformation and a high energy conformation, just like we saw with myosin, how it had the low energy constant. Con, uh, Confirmation and ATP bound to it, it phosphorylated itself, absorbed the energy, and moved to a different confirmation. And then it released that energy by going back. Same thing happening here. That's this is the whole cycle. So here we are starting at this point here where you've got um, the enzyme facing the in, inside of the cell. So at this point, you've got ATP bound to the to the protein three sodiums come in and they go into this little channel in the middle of the protein. Once that happens, once it's all loaded up, the enzyme will phosphorylate itself, thus it's a p-type pump. And it, like right here, the energy is still in the bond, but then the energy goes into a conformational change. You know, I always like to say this, that, you know, you take this huge negatively charged phosphate, right? It's got two and a half negative charges on it. You put that in the air in, put that onto a protein and all the positive charges around and negative charges of the protein are going to respond to that huge negative charge. And that translates into changing the shape of the whole protein. So here, this is the E1 conformation when it's facing inside. And then that energy gets absorbed by the, um, by the protein and it changes to its E2 conformation. This is the high energy conformation. 
And in this conformation, the channel is, fo is facing outside of the cell and those three sodium come out. Then two potassium come in and bind inside that channel. Now this protein will be stuck in this E2 conformation until that happens. So it waits for two potassium to come. Once it does, it's going to defos, oops, sorry. Once it comes, it will dephosphorylate itself and go back into the E1 conformation. And in the E1 conformation, those potassiums then <clears throat> come into the cell and it picks up ATP. Okay, so just going over that really quickly one more time. You've got your E1 and your E2 conformation. In the E1 conformation, it binds ATP and then three, eight, three sodiums and it phosphorylates itself. The energy from the phosphate then causes this um, conformational change into the high energy state, the E2 conformation, and it releases its sodium on the outside. Potassium binds to it, and then it goes downhill back to its low energy conformation by releasing that phosphate and back down to where we started. Okay, any questions about that? Oops, let me do that again. It's a really cool animation. I'm not sure if this is the one, let's see. Oh, this is the one, pause it. Now, someone in this class taught me this last time. I can do the playback speed very, very slow. So let's, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Okay, so here we have AT, is this the ATP? All right, let's watch it go and then I'll explain it. Okay, here, okay, these are the three sodium. This is the ATP down here, sodium are in the channel. Now the, the enzymes- um, going We can't, you're, you're sharing the slideshow with us, Phil. Damn it, damn it. I do that all the time, I'm sorry. Thanks for telling me. Okay, it's just as well, because it gave me a minute to figure out what the hell I'm trying to talk about. Okay, you can see it now? This is our sodium potassium ATPase. Um, so down here, we've got ATP bound, and here come the sodiums over here. So sodiums come in, they go into the channel, now the enzyme's going to autophosphorylate down here. And when it does, okay, there it's phosphorylated itself there. ADP is going to leave. Because of that phosphate, the whole thing shifted and now it's opening up here. Sodiums go out, potassiums come in. And now this phosphate should come off. Come on, baby. Gives off a little pop when it comes out. Oh, see, it didn't. It should, it just didn't. All right, let's see that again without me talking. Okay, so that is your sodium potassium ATPase. <clears throat> and all of the P-type pumps are going to have that, going to have the same mechanism, except that, you know, if it's a calcium ATPase, calcium comes in, um, it phosphorylates itself, calcium goes out, and then it just goes right back to the E1 conformation because it's only transporting the one thing at a time. Any questions about that?
Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Check my notes real quick to make sure I'm not forgetting something. Yeah, I've got this all written pretty <clears throat> clearly, I think, anyway, in my notes. So you can look that over later. Okay, so that's active transport. And only, only, only active transport or ATP aces are called pumps. Okay, people mess that up a lot. They'll, on a test, they'll call a, a facilitated, facilitated transporter a pump, and it's not. There's no energy involved. Okay, but... Do, do, do. What else we want to talk about today is the second half, which is your uh, your um, uh, indirect active transport. And so you've always got one thing going downhill in energy, so it's negative delta G, and the other thing's going uphill in energy, positive delta G. And there's always more energy released than used. Um, and that keeps it, it's spontaneous, keeps it moving in one direction. Okay, and here we are again. So we've got um, two sodiums. So we, here we're, we're gonna use that sodium gradient that's produced by the sodium potassium ATPA. So sodium's high outside. So two sodiums will bind to this transporter. This is the sodium glucose transporter. I think in, in, your, um, in your notes, I call it SG. I call it SGLT. Sodium glucose transporter. So sodium binds. Transporter can't move yet. Glucose binds. Now once it's got both of those things bound, it will flip to the other um, conformation. And just like a like a regular um, facilitate trans transport, it flips in this direction, and then your sodium and potassium, your sodium and glucose come in, and now it's empty, and it flips back to the other state. Now, the reason why this is different from a facilitated transporter is that it can only go in this direction, right? Because you're never going to have a higher concentration of sodium on the inside than the outside. If you did, you know, you could do that experimentally. You could take a cell and reverse the, the sodium ion concentrations and it would probably go backwards. I, I'm sure it would. But in a normal cell, sodium is always higher outside. And so you're always going to be going in this direction. And so it's pumping glucose or pumping. I'm sorry. I made the mistake now. Transporting glucose into the cell using that sodium, sodium uh, gradient. Why bother, right? If you've already got a glucose transporter, why a sodium glucose transporter? Good question, Dr. Slish. Let me answer it for you. Um, so you've got glucose transporters in all your cells. Every cell has got that. And that's how your cell gets glucose in, right? Glucose is the main source of energy for your cells. Um, and you're, you will see in chapter 23 that your cells will move glucose transporters into the membrane and out of the membrane as it needs more glucose. So, or as the body needs to get rid of glucose. For example, we'll see this in chapter 23. When your blood glucose level is high, your pancreas gives off uh, insulin. Insulin goes to cells with insulin receptors and they put glucose transporters into the membrane and they bring glucose out of the blood and into the cell, okay? So that's how you're, you're regulating glucose inside the cell as well as in your blood. Now with these uh, indirect active transporters, these are used in situations where you really, you're not just trying to get glucose in, you're trying to empty that outside space of glucose, get it all in, be as efficient as possible to get all that glucose into your cell. Where is that? in your intestines and in your kidneys. So in your intestines, you're eating food and to be efficient, you wanna get all the glucose out of your intestine um, and get it into your body. You don't want glucose leaving through the, through the poop chute, right? Because that's just wasted. So you've got this active transport bringing all the glucose into your body. Um, also in the, um, in the um, kidneys, uh, 
blood comes into the kidneys. I don't know how, if you guys have had physiology. Blood comes into the kidneys and in the glomerular apparatus, all the fluid part of the blood goes into the nephron. And so you're losing all this glucose when that happens. Um, so you've got all this glucose into that filtrate, and now you've got these active transporters pulling it back into your body. So you're not urinating your glucose out. When do you urinate your glucose out? That happens when you're diabetic, right? Your glucose levels are way, way sky high. Should be 80 milligrams per deciliter. It's up to 400. So we talked about saturation of enzymes in the last class. Um, when you've got that much glucose in your in the filtrate that's in your in your um, uh, nephron, you saturate these transporters. They can't transport any faster. It ends up in your urine, and that's that's what happens with uh, um, type one or I guess both types of diabetes, and that's and that's the main diagnostic for um, diabetes. The doctor will drink your urine and see if it tastes sweet. Not true. I made that up. But they used to do that. <laughs> they used to do that back in the day. Yeah. What a wonderful modern world we live in where we don't have to drink glucose, drink urine anymore to diagnose people. Okay. You know, I miss in-person classes because normally if I made a joke like that, I see a lot of cringy faces and that's kind of why I'm doing it. I love that cringy face, you know? Oh, well. Anyway, bottom line, indirect active transport, you've got two things going in the same direction. Sodium's going down its, its, its uh, concentration gradient, and glucose is going up. It's being concentrated in the cell. Can someone just, like, when I say something like that, just put chat, just chat, say, ooh, that's gross. That's all I want. I don't think I'm asking for too much. Claire's on it. Claire's on it. Okay. Thanks, Claire. You're welcome. Right here. What's that? You're welcome. <laughs> so here's another indirect active transport. What's different about this is it's an antiporter instead of a symporter. This is the sodium calcium exchanger. So this allows three so takes three sodiums in for one calcium out. So Remember our cardiac contraction. Calcium came in to um, to contract the cell. Now to relax the cell, most of that cal most of the calcium from the SR is going to go back into the SR. But you've got external calcium coming in that needs to be removed as well. Um, so two ways to do that, which we'll talk about later in this in the class. One is your plasma membrane calcium ATPase. But that's a little bit slow. That's not the fastest way to get it out. This is the fastest way to get it out. So the initial dip in calcium concentration for the relaxation of the cardiac muscle is because of this sodium calcium exchanger. During the, um, the rest, you know, during action potential, sodium is higher inside than outside. So it's not, it shuts off. But when the, when the cell repolarizes, sodium's higher outside and it comes in and it transports calcium out. So where does the energy come for that to happen? It comes from our sodium potassium ATPase. Um, so this, this is the sodium potassium ATPase pumping three sodium out for two potassium in. So, uh-oh, uh-oh, my computer's dying. Okay, if my computer goes, Hang on, I'll be back in five minutes. I think it's gonna die pretty soon though. But here, this shows how the sodium potassium ATPase is linked to the cal sodium calcium exchanger. Okay, how are these things used in cells? So, so you know you've got your uh, facilitated diffusion, your active transport, and your indirect active. How is this used? I was just talking about how in the kidney you really wanna get all of that glucose back in. So over here is your loop of Henle, right, in the nephron. You're using a sodium glucose transporter to get that into the cell. Once you do, now it's higher in the cell than it is in the blood. So you just need a regular glucose transporter um, to, to let it back out of the cell, okay? We don't need energy at this side because we've concentrated glucose in the cell and it can leave. 
how what causes this to work? Well, you've always got your sodium potassium ATPase over here on the basal lateral side, pumping sodium out. That's keeping sodium low in the cell and keeping that gradient so you can pump glucose or transport glucose in. Okay, so that's an example example there how we've got three different transporters and they're all um, they're all working together to do one function. Um, what's most important to keep to, when I do these things and I'll do other ones and there'll be some on the test. What's most important about these is where's the energy coming from? When is energy needed? When is energy not needed? And also balancing the ions, right? If this kept going and there wasn't sodium potassium ATPase, eventually your sodium would increase in the cell too, and this would shut down, right? You want to keep it in go going in this direction, you get rid of that sodium, and then this can keep moving. And potassium then um, is always high inside the cell. Okay. Calcium metabolism. This is really, really important. So this is a figure from your book. I like my figure better. So calcium metabolism is about keeping calcium low inside the cell. So extracellular calcium is about one or two millimolar. Again, that's set by um, your kidneys and by your parathyroid, which is releasing parathyroid hormone, which is controlling your, your calcium levels. So that's physiologically controlled. Inside the cell, it's about 0.1. This should be, um, it's not millimolar, it's uh, uh, micromolar. Um, that's wrong. I, uh, damn it. Damn it to hell. Damn your eyes. You. I'm just going to do this for now. Uh, it didn't work so great. But anyway, I'll fix it later. But it's 0.1 micromolar, actually 0.5 micromolar, I believe. I'll fix this in, in later and, wanna, and I'll re-upload this. But it's about 0.5 micromolar. So going from one micromolar to 0.5 micromolar, that's 20,000 times different in concentration. So you've got a huge concentration gradient for calcium to come in. In this SER, in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, you've got 10 millimolar calcium. So you've got an even greater concentration gradient for calcium to leave the SR, or S, the smooth ER. How does that happen? Well, we've got three different, two, two mechanisms that are going to allow calcium to increase in the cell, and three that keep, keep calcium low inside the cell. So in terms of decreasing calcium in the cell, we've got two plasma membrane um, uh, uh, transporters and one smooth ER transporter. So at the plasma membrane, we've got the plasma membrane calcium ATPase and the sodium calcium exchanger. <clears throat> so these are, are both decreasing calcium in the cell. Over here on the circa, we've got our, uh, over here on the smooth ER, we've got our smooth endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, that's our circa, pumping calcium into the, into the ER. So that's keeping this high and this low. Oh shoot, I'm, I'm, I'm about to leave. I'll be back in five minutes. My computer's dying. Um, to increase calcium in the cell, now you've got these concentration gradients. All you have to do is open a channel and calcium will come in. You've got a calcium, calcium channels on the cell surface, a number of different types, voltage dependent we've talked about, receptor operated, stretch operated, temperature operated, a lot of different kinds of channels and they can all let calcium in. You've got two different calcium channels on the smooth ER. One we've talked about already, this guy here, ryanodine receptor, which is calcium activated, calcium induced calcium release. Remember that from cardiac muscle. And then we've got our IP3 receptor, which we haven't talked about. We'll talk about in chapter 23. And that's when an acetyl trisphosphate binds to it, it opens and calcium comes out. So this, because of those calcium concentration gradients, calcium is going to increase fast in the cell, really fast. And it will go down pretty fast too because of all the other mechanisms. So it's used as a, as a second messenger kind of, it changes the physiology of the cell. Contract, relax the muscle, um, cause 
uh, secretion in gland cells, a lot of different things it can do. All right. I will be back. <laughs> <laughs>